earliest I think I've ever performed poetry. Um, but it's awesome. I really, really love this space. Okay, um, so one of my favourite poets in the world is called Amy Leon, and she thinks that we don't breathe enough. So I'm just going to like us to take a nice deep breath. You breathe from your belly. They want to keep us thin. It's one. Um, breathe from here. Deep breath in for five, and then out for five. So in one, two, three, four, five, and then out for five. Um, okay, so I personally think my life is like built up into like four major compartments. There's family, um, there's love life, there's professional life, and there's social life. I'm going to do three poems for you today. I don't write about my friends because most of them are poets and it's just never going to be good enough for them. <laughs> so we'll go with family, professional, and love life. And I really like oversharing to complete strangers, so we'll start with my love life. <laughs> Um, this one is called On Loving a Burning Building. I always believe that you are arguing with me. I think it's because your eyes seem to speak defiance as fluently as they speak love, and I didn't know that eyes could be bilingual. I always seem to talk even more around you. I think it's because I believe keeping my lips busy will make them forget. I didn't know that lips had a muscle memory that could not be talked away and that someone else's mouth could become my favourite tattoo. I always visualise the tension you carry in your shoulders. I think it's because you are trying to teach yourself not to hide behind a straight back and a smile, but it's still not very good at holding yourself tall. I didn't know I could feel the pain in someone else's posture. I guess that is a side effect of borrowing someone else's backbone. I always clasp my hand to my stomach when I am with you. I think it's an attempt to feel grounded or less empty somehow. I didn't know that trying to hold myself upright in this way would not stop me falling when you leave. I guess that's a side effect of using someone else as your sustenance. Because you cannot live off someone who is notoriously bad at feeding themselves. I always say that the heat from a burning building can still keep you warm and cook your food if you allow it to. The trick is to not stand too close to the flames and don't try and save the building, just use the fire. I think I say this because I personally never learned the difference between a heat that seeks to feed me and cook my food and a heat that seeks to burn. I just know that warm weather does not stop me seeing the cold air in my own breath and that you, you have always been heat. Thank you. So why not go professional life? So I'm a student as well as um, being a poet and um, there was a brief period of time when I, um, I thought the 9 to 5 grind might be for me. Um, soon realised it wasn't and I went for this one particular job interview. Right? And, um, and so I, I was unsuccessful, which is absolutely fine. It was, um, it was for recruitment as well, which is massive respect to anyone doing it as well because it's, uh, it's a hard profession. So I, um, I requested feedback and... Um, the feedback was like two sentences and all it said was that like my hair was a little bit professional and distracting. <laughs> um, and so um, when something like that happens, apparently I write poetry about it. <laughs> it's just how I handle it. Um, and so this one is uh, called To the Woman Who Described My Hair as Unprofessional in Job Interview Feedback. Very imaginative title. <laughs> I couldn't name her, I thought, because knowing my luck, someone she knows will be at an event I'm at or something, it will find its way back to her. Um, so I just, that's, that's him, the title. You described my hair as unprofessional. I guess that's because professional means straight and white. I am too much for you and I accept that. I have never followed patterns and rules. It seems my hair hasn't either. Neither of us wish to be tamed. You call it wild i call it alive because apparently whilst my hair is good enough for strangers to touch even when i don't want them to it is also the reason why i shouldn't get high and listen my hair is coconut oil covered beauty it is meticulously looked after glory it is all of the hours i have spent lovingly detangling your hate cannot undo the share butter barrier i have at each of these curls in i have spent years massaging pride into the scalp, and I have taught each hair on this head its history. Your hate cannot undo the education by this point. 
there seems to be more power in one hair on this head than in your entire existence. And so, if my hair is too big, I suggest it might be time to make work. Thank you. So, um, let's do family. Yeah, um, my mum is my best friend, and I think like parental relationships to me are always really, really interesting. Um, because whilst they're uh, almost always the most important people in your life, um, there's often massive generation gaps and identity gaps. And it's just always a really, really complex relationship. And um, a lot of poets I know, including myself, are just trying to explore that as well. And I think it's really interesting. Um, yeah, and so this one um, is called after my mum, so it's just called Rachel King. It's quite a boring title, but it seems to fit. <laughs> My mum was raised on a strict diet of stiff upper lips, and so she doesn't really like it when mine quivers. She was told that tears are useless as she was growing up, and so she confesses she's never really been good at sadness since. She is the coldness you feel on your hands when you remove your fingers from warm running water, but she's also the warmth that continues to curse for your veins despite the unexpected chill. She is passive aggressive beauty. The vocal inflection at the end of a sarcastic comment, she is the sarcastic comment, but she is also the compliment. And she is quintessentially British, though I don't think she quite knows what that means, and she is in a different world to me. Speaking behind a white veil that neither of us can see through, and see, living in two different worlds is fine if you can build sturdy bridges between them, but me and mum, we are both good at words, but neither of us have ever been builders. And anyway, we are both carrying the weight of our worlds on our backs, and that is heavy. I don't think a bridge could support all of that. She is the happiest times of my life. Her face is with me every time I laugh, but at times I think she is happier with a fake laugh than a genuine sob. It's like expressions of my pain remind her there is nothing she can do about them, and one of my tears opens a Pandora's box of things that are too big for her and her world to deal with. But what she fails to grasp is that that box is open for me already. Over dinner, she asks me if I have ever thought about time travel. I say, sure, mum, but I would have to be careful about where I go. They are still throwing bricks through the windows of that combs today. She says, yes, and the butterflies. You wouldn't want to step on a butterfly and enter the world. And I roll my eyes and laugh simultaneously because I love the first thought. I love the fact that her first thought was butterflies when mine had to be fear. But I wonder which world she is worried about me and the butterflies ending. Thank you, guys. Do you want me to be your personal clicker? Oh, I hadn't even thought about the clicking bit. Um, I'll you. click. Okay. Do I just double tap on that? Um... You just... Okay. Hi, guys. I've never done a PowerPoint before. That's why I didn't know the clicking thing. That might seem quite obvious. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, that was just amazing. I feel completely inspired now, and I sort of just want to go to the back row and chat to you and not talk for a second. But, so, I'm here to talk about what I know, which is a very interesting point, because you never really stop to think about it until someone very sweetly asks you to come and talk to a group of strangers. So I started writing it all down. I watched a video of a talk from here before with my mum. We ate some soup. And we watched this guy's talk. What was his name? Was it Jason? Jason. Jason. Did anyone hear Jason's talk? Jason Briscoe. So we were going through his talk, and my mum was like, oh, it's very good. It's very, <laughs> that's very good. That's very, very good. <laughs> and, um, and I just thought, I'll stop watching his and just do mine now. So this is my very first PowerPoint. My lovely friend Mark helped me with it. It's very simple. Um, I'm going to talk. And I think at the end we've got time for questions. And then if there's anything you want to talk about, if time runs out, because I'm quite conscious that I talk a lot. So just come and chat to me. I, I couldn't believe when I walked in how great you all are, people just coming up and talking. Um, that sort of you'll see through my, my chat, that's what I'm hoping I can have more of in my life, because it's incredibly nourishing. I sort of feel like I've been in a spa, and I've only been here an hour. So thank you for being so smiley 
and thanks for smiling now. So I'm going to start. Right. Um, yes, the, the theme is Pioneers. When you first emailed me that, I, my throat sort of closed up and I thought, oh gosh. Um, so I wouldn't describe myself, I wouldn't self-describe myself as a pioneer because, but it's very nice, because I think what's interesting about the, what I do is I'm actually helping bring back the, the age-old ways of eating, the traditional ways of eating that we've lost contact with. We've sort of really overcomplicated our relationship with food and eating, and I go on to talk about that a bit more, but it, it was a very interesting thought process, and I think that the, the old ways are coming back in, and just the fact that we started off, I didn't know that was going to happen, with the stretching, we stood up, the way we chatted as we walked in, the way we listened to beautiful words and completely fell into your head and your heart just now, um, that's what I'm about. And it is food, but it's so much more, because food is always the beginning. Okay, so that's my hello slide done. Woo, I've done one. Okay, so the next one. Ah, uh, right, an unconventional start. Okay, so the way I started was completely random. Um, it, it was about seven, eight years ago, and it's... It is, I, 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 I've got to be careful of not starting to tell you the whole story, because the whole story will take an hour, but I just want to say that it was completely random, and when I was clicking on who's attending today, and I saw so many of you, and I started scrolling through your jobs, I started you know, looking up what you were doing. I was like, that's really cool. I wonder if I could ever do that. Or I think that there are so many ways we can live our lives. And at the moment, this is 100% the way I want to live it. And I love that it leads into different things. But I really want to stress here, I had no intention of working in food. I probably didn't even cook anything really until I was 21. And I'm 32 now. I, um, does anyone know the show Ready, Steady, Cook? Yes, okay, good. And everyone's nodding and smiling, so you know what it means. If you've not watched Ready, Steady, Cook, um, is it still hosted by Ainsley? Anyone know? We're all too busy at four o'clock now on a weekday, aren't we? But it was, if you don't know, it was a show at four o'clock on a weekday called Ready, Steady, Cook, an amazing man called Ainsley, full of life, and two sets of people and an audience, and one group was called Green Tomatoes and one Red Peppers, or the other way around. That's it. And it just really got me into cooking because it looked fun. There was a group, it was social, and it was also about, here's a bunch of ingredients, make something out of it. And I love that because we have, um, we've sort of become, I thought growing up, that if you're a chef, you had to be a bit Gordon Ramsay-esque, you had to be shouty, sweary, train for years, labor every point, not re really seem to enjoy it and, you know, foam everything and essence everything. So I found the world of food quite scary. I was very nourished by my mother's food. She's Filipino, my dad was in the army, we grew up in army barracks. Um, and what I was actually gonna say was, in many ways, they sort of fetishized, I can't say that word, do you know what I mean? Fetishized that uh, food in the sense that they were obsessed with not wasting anything. My mum was from a very poor family, my dad was in the army, it was all about rations, not wasting, emergency food, what if something happened? My mom, one of my mum's favourite sayings is, if you don't eat that, you'll be the first to die in a war. I mean, that's depressing. <laughs> <laughs> it's fatalistic. I mean, so, in, I know a lot of people that have had, I know a lot of us have very emotional relationships with food. We might have been treated and rewarded with food. We might have had food held back from us as a, as a sort of um, incentive. My way was, you know, if you don't eat that grain of rice, you go to hell type thing. But what it did teach me was to really respect food. And my mum is the queen of leftovers. My sister's the other queen of leftovers. We grew up knowing how to put food together. And we didn't, we, you know, my mum, she actually stayed at my house last night. I was out, she was looking after my dog. You know, she went into my fridge, and I thought I didn't even have very much in there. And I came home, and she told me about what she'd done with the little bit of this and the little bit of that. And so I had that background. Um, but here I am, going on about this second slide. I need to move on. But what happened was, I, I, um, it was very random. It was, it was a, a guy in a band, it's still a band in England now, who said, I, who found out through friends that my sister and I love to host very, very basic dinner parties. And when I mean very basic dinner parties, I mean we'd cook up a stew or a soup from the leftovers in our fridge. 
that's going back to what our parents taught us. And he said, I want a piece of that. And we were like, really? Uh, what do you mean? He's like, oh, I need a private chef. We're like, God, we're not private chefs. We just make soups and stews. Long story short, he wanted food that his mum would make him or that his sister would make him or the sort of food you want to eat, which is bowl food. And nobody did that. And nobody, um, I think there was one raw food delivery. There was no delivery. There was no, you know, cast your mind back seven years ago. It was maybe the very beginning of prep. You know, it was all about, if you wanted a sandwich, it was M&S or Boots. So we started a week of cooking with this person, making soups and shoes, and by the end of it, the whole band was on board, and they wanted us to go on tour with them, which we said no to, and I'll talk about saying no in a minute. Um, but that's how it started, and I think it was day two into this one week where we said, we'll cook for you a bit, but then we'll teach you how to do it. Day two, where I completely fell in love with the buzz of making someone feel better through basically a bowl of blended vegetables um, and, you know, some lovely homemade chicken broth. That's how it started. Um, but going on to food, I won't talk too much about just food today, but uh, what I said is, is, how has it become so complicated? How has it become so confusing? At the end of the day, the, what I try and show is, you know, not being a nutritionist, not being a chef, a trained chef, is that whole foods, not whole food the shop, whole foods is in a complete food is always the way to go. It's naturally good for you. If you can cook it yourself, so much the better. If you can have someone that you love cook it, even better. The love that goes into food is the secret ingredient. And the questions we ask of our suppliers, so the questions we ask of prep, the questions we ask of our butchers, we just need to ask questions. And I, can, I know you're a very curious bunch, but um, if, if we can always ask, and if you work in an office and you can say, you know what, if you could feed us better, maybe we'll be more productive, maybe we'll have less sick days, all of these things. So I love that from starting with a bowl of soup, I'm now part of, and there's lots of us, a community of people who are helping bring back that age-old way of eating. Right, I better go on to the second, third slide. Um, right, get a game plan. So as I said, it was random, we didn't know what we were doing. Um, my sister and I started it together, her name's Jasmine. We I don't know, has anyone worked with family? No. I love it, everyone's like, no, do you? Oh, you have done, okay. So, you know, it's interesting because in an ideal world, whether you work with family or a partner or a, uh, any kind of business partner, you'd have strengths and weaknesses. You know, I've told you a little bit about my mum. We kind of have the same strengths and weaknesses, me and my sister, in that we're both quite, kind, of, kind of anxious, you know, from, you know, army and mother. And, um, we were so nervous to write a plan. We almost, the whole point of having a plan, right, is to sort of focus you. We were too nervous to write the plan in case we got the plan wrong. So my advice would probably be to create your idea of a plan. It's just so great to have goals, whether they're short-term, long-term. I know you know this, but if you're working with somebody else as well, try and check that you're on board with the same things because that's super important. Um, another thing was, because we started randomly, we didn't have too high expectations on ourselves, which was actually really, really nice. And we were doing something that I knew wouldn't go out of fashion. And actually, as I've said, I wanted to bring it back into fashion, this idea of home-cooked food, or you know, just good food coming back onto the market. Um, and also supporting smaller people. So in a way, I feel like I'm a vehicle for the incredible suppliers out there, the people that are making the chickens that I like to make broth out of, the people making the beautiful vegetables that might be ugly and too ugly for a supermarket, but are just as good for your stomach and your health. Um, so the Dreaming Big is a big one for me. We have, I still have loads of the dreams I started out with that I don't feel any closer to touching yet. It's only been seven years. But I know that that's my game plan. So whenever I get a little bit despondent, I've got that one. So in my head, you know, I'd love to one day have soups available for everyone at a great, great price. And the reason I keep going on about soups, I should probably tell you, is <laughs> soups are so unsexy. But if you've ever had a good soup, you know, right? You can have terrible soups, but you can have a great soup. And a great soup is good because obviously the flavors kick, you know, kick out. Um, the texture's just right, it's not too hot, too cold, it's easily digestible, um, you can... Does anyone eat their lunch when they're stressed? <laughs> yes, everyone, right? So even maybe this morning, you came in, you were rushing, you started eating your granola, and 
Did it, it doesn't kind of fit, sit well, does it? Because you're, like, you're trying to chew, you're drinking your coffee, you're chatting, you're working out where you're going to sit. Soups can be such a wonderful thing. So I would say if you have any troubles with your digestion, and I reckon it's most of you because a lot of us do, is have a flask of soup, even if you buy someone else's and can't make your own, and sip at it. Or put it in a mug and sip at it if you feel like you don't have time to spoon it into your mouth because it definitely will help you. Um, in the same way that sometimes you can't eat... I mean, it's cold now, right? Who's going to eat a raw salad at lunchtime in England? It's just too hard to process. Anyway, I'm getting distracted by soups. I knew I'd do this. Every slide's becoming about soups. Um, <laughs> also, back to my mum. Yeah, game plan. Um, go as fast as you want, um, especially if you get investors. I don't have any investors yet. We talked about it at one point to quite a few, and I just felt that they wanted me to race through it, and I just didn't feel like I was going to deliver, and I felt like I would constantly, constantly be disappointing them and my worst fear, disappointing myself. Um, so my mum, again, you know, she'll, she loves sending a link, you know, did you know that deliciously Ella's got balls in uh, Tesco now? Yes, mum, I do. Ah, <laughs> oh, Jamie Oliver's got a new shower. I know, mum, it's great. And it is fantastic to have your competition. You know, your competition's great. It keeps you motivated, it keeps you going. But just go at your own pace. That's me telling myself that, go at your own pace. Um, another thing is, um, going back to your gut, I always listen to my gut. So when Victoria was emailing me, I read it and I was like, ugh, I said my throat closed up. And then my gut went, yeah, do it. And my, the, another part of me was going, no, don't do it. You don't have time to write anything. You don't know how to do a PowerPoint. Um, you don't have time for this. And it just felt completely right. And I'm so happy to be here because as I say, when I walked in, you, you're all smiling at me now. I'm feeling quite emotional. It's fantastic. But the gut tells you, has anyone sort of ever done either that pros and cons list, taken advice? Oh, advice sometimes can be the worst, can't it? I, the number of times I've taken advice from people and it's gone wrong and I didn't listen to my gut, it's huge. Some of my, all of my best decisions, I'd say, have been from my gut. I haven't necessarily been able to explain them to anyone else, but I just knew. And when I've not listened to it and instead let somebody else say to me, this person's really good, they worked here, they could take your business to this level or they could give you that advice, it's gone a bit wrong. Not terribly wrong, but... It just hasn't worked out. So for now, I'll, I'll continue to listen to my gut. And another thing that I found is, again, with the going slow, is be good at one thing. So at the moment, it's food. As I say, food always is at the heart of everything. I'm also massively interested in so many other things. You mentioned self-love. Um, the fact that food's become so complicated is not, it's not unique to the food industry. Look at beauty guys and girls, our makeup products, the things we put in our hair. Um, and Tony was saying about coconut oil. You know, like, do you remember when coconut oil, we weren't talking about coconut oil, and now it's something, because we were buying a million products for our hair. And actually, for me, coconut oil is the best thing. We got so far removed from everything. We, we have, uh, all of our packaging has 12,000 ingredients in it. So I'd love to look at natural ways of beauty moving forward. I'm really interested in ethical fashion as well. My first job was for a sustainable ethical shoe company and the shoes were so ugly, but they really were, <laughs> they mattered. And um, you know, they're doing really well now, they're, they're less ugly, but uh, that's another story. So I think it's really important to be good at one thing first. Be braver than brave. Okay, so being, being braver than brave, um, I, I, you know, this for me is me being really brave. Um, I think, there's two main things with the braveness factor is it's be brave to say yes, like here today, um, and be brave to say no, which I think I mentioned before. I don't like saying no. I like to please people. Um, I, I feel like I could miss out. Um, what, who are, ah, Jane, Jane Fonda's in town at the moment. Did anyone watch Graham Norton, the Graham Norton show? And I was then on Twitter, I think, and they, I think Graham Norton then interviewed Jane Fonda another day later. And somebody on my Twitter wrote, oh my God, I love Jane Fonda, she wrote this. And she said, it's taken me 70 years to realize that no is a complete sentence. I was like, that's genius, Jane. I completely relate to that, do you? Can you say no? No, <laughs> no, you can't. Um, but 
again, with the going slow, with the wanting to make a mark, with the wanting to keep up, I have found it really hard to say no. But going back to my gut, that's what it's told me to do many, many times, and it's been right. Um, I think comfort zones is a big one. My sort of natural comfort zone is um, enthusiastic, but sort of slight shades of anxiety, um, massive perfectionism. I'm a Virgo. Anyone else, if you are a Virgo or know a Virgo, you are, you know, you love lists, cr crazy, she's saying. Um, I wasn't going to say that, but yeah, okay, cr you know, full on. Um, that's my comfort zone, is to question and, and analyze and want things to be better. And one thing I've learned as well is that it is really important to get rid of the perfection, perfection ideals um, and to let things go. The number of times I've labored over an email, um, and God, it's not perfect, it's not perfect. Um, or a, a, the, the game plan or um, a book. So I've, I've now just written my third book. I'd love to be able to tell you that I learned my lesson on books one and two and worked out how to write a book more efficiently and all these things, but I didn't because of my perfectionist syndrome. Is that the right way of saying perfectionism syndrome? Perfectionist syndrome? I'm not sure. It shouldn't even have a name because it shouldn't exist. But <laughs> if you are one of those people, someone told me, you know, it's, I remember, I think it was my editor, she was like, look, Melissa, it's not perfect, but it's done. It's good. And that is a really big thing. If you want to keep evolving, you've got to get away from this idea. Um, and the most chilled people I know, the people that really enjoy their lives, are able to let things go and go, I've done that. You know what? Maybe I would have done this, but it's done. I'm happy with it. And that is something that I have for every year had as my sort of New Year's resolution, or I think birthday resolutions are a good one, but then that's the Virgo in me, isn't it, going, it's my birthday, I'm gonna make some resolutions and be better. <laughs> but yeah, be braver than brave is my big one. Um, last thing on this, cold calling. So when my sister and I did two years of cooking, um, we, we literally were squirreled away in basements and people's kitchens, having the best time learning our trade, um, cooking for people, their families, their colleagues, and then, um, all of our friends and family were saying, oh, come on, you know, like, you're doing all this for this band. Um, I can see the difference in them. Lots of them were saying things like, you know, it's never been about weight loss for us. It's about energy levels, um, the, way, the ability to be able to tackle things more easily and more enjoyably and more blissfully, basically. Sleep as well, which I'll talk about. I remember one client saying three days of having our soups he felt like he'd woken up from like a sort of sleeping beauty wake up. He felt less foggy headed, he could concentrate, all the things we want. Um, so my friends were going, I want that. My mom was going, I want that. And I was like, I can't do it. You know, I'm busy cooking for these people. And everyone said, well, write down the recipes. Now you might think that sounds really easy, but to write a recipe if you've never written one, if the way you cook is intuitive, it's the vegetables at the market, it's the broth, it's the tasting, it's very difficult. So we started writing the recipes um, obviously, they were never perfect enough. Kept going through that, trying to do it in our spare time. And then someone said, again, this is about six years ago now, someone said, write a blog. I was like, oh, God. No, because it won't be perfect. We haven't got time to do it. And one day, I'd had enough, so I Googled how to write a blog. And I think it said, it came up, WordPress, or what's the other one? Square, what? Squarespace. Squarespace. I don't think that even existed there then. Maybe. But WordPress was the first one that came up, so I clicked on it. And I set it up that day, and I remember I wrote the first blog post, and I think it was about apple cider vinegar, which I won't talk about now, but apple cider vinegar is great. <laughs> so then I, then I had about two viewers, you know, my mum and me. And then I thought, <laughs> okay, I've just spent a day writing this post about apple cider vinegar. Who's going who's gonna to read it? And then I went, oh, so this is going back to my dream big, and be braver than brave. I went, oh, I need to find a partner. Who shall I ask? I was like, I know, Vogue. Now, I didn't know anyone at Vogue. <laughs> I was like, well, if I had my dream scenario, I, I, I'd partner up with Vogue. And I don't know what I was on that day, obviously being really brave, um, vibing off the high of creating my first blog post. And I emailed every single person I knew and went, do you know anyone at Vogue? Anyone at Vogue? Anyone at Vogue? I had no, I had no contacts at Vogue. And after about two months, um, obviously running the business in this whole time, someone said, oh, someone, someone's girlfriend started working in the fashion department. So then I just harassed her on her first day going, can you find out who I should talk to about food at Vogue? 
nobody, nobody, there's no one at Vogue doing food. Um, they had Nigella Lawson a while ago, but nobody talks about food. And they went, oh, maybe it's the beauty department. So they had no one in food. Anyway, so then I got a hold of a, the head of beauty, Nicola Moulton, harassed her. Um, and then she went, okay then, well, as long as you're happy to not talk about calories, dieting, or fat, I was like, perfect, I am. I, that's not, I don't want to talk about those things. She went, let's, give me one recipe and we'll see how it goes. And then the next day she was like, it's going well, give me more recipes. And that's how it started. And then it all just kicked off and we weren't prepared for it. As I say, we were just down in the kitchens every day. And obviously once you're in Vogue, I mean, this is again, six years ago, Vogue was, there weren't very many media, um, digital titles. There was no Instagram. This is like, Twitter was around Facebook, but it was more of a personal thing. There was no business profiles. I can't even remember six years ago. I mean, Vogue was it, and it had just launched or was starting to do well, but it's vogue.co.uk. Anyway, so in terms of cold calling people, um, I don't know if this is your vibe already, but I find it really works. That, I think that point illustrates it. It doesn't always work, but it worked this time. And some of the people, this one particular lady who's now one of my, become one of my best friends, she cold emailed and said, can I help you? Um, wash up on a shoot or something. She really played it down. She turned out to be the most amazing um, cook and food stylist. She cold emailed me and we get a lot of emails but her email really stood out and now as I say she's part of my team. She's a great friend. I'd say she's one of my best friends and we, we laugh about the way that we met over email. So it obviously works. It obviously matters that you have a great concept that you want to tell this person and that you have a great email and I always find as well, attachments for me don't really work. Is anyone like that? I look at a lot on the tube and things don't load up and that great opening line um, can really get you. So I, I, I really recommend cold calling people. Find your tribe or make one. This is, this is my new tribe. <laughs> um, I think this is so incredibly important. Um, find your tribe. I feel like I've got quite a few tribes of people that I completely love. I've got my... Um, people that I love to go to exercise with and they're the people that really motivate me to get out the house because I spend a lot of time at home cooking, writing. Um, they're my sort of like very energetic tribe. Then I've got my tribe who are in my industry and we all support each other when we deal with any negativity. We're there for each other, we talk about it. And I actually was going to talk about the critics, actually. I think it's really important when you're ever criticised to... I, I think it's really important to work out, maybe have a look at where maybe you've gone wrong or where, where you haven't got it quite right. Because I often find it could be the, a tone of phrase I've used or I haven't explained something because I felt pressured to say something in a very short form because it's been on Twitter or Instagram or something. And it's just an understanding. So we love talking about... I love negative feedback, <laughs> you know, give me some after this. Um, you really, really learn from it. So I've got tribes that I can chat to and really delve into. Um, I think this is crazy, but a lot of people are like, oh, wow, you're really sort of, um, you've got a lot of female friends and you're really pro-women, aren't you? I've heard that a lot. And I'm, yes, I am. Um, that's crazy that you're saying that. But there's, a, there's a, quite a few bunches of us that all get together. And, you know, guys are welcome too. It's just that... You know, we tend to be a bit more open, these particular groups of ours, when it's just us, you know, no partners and so on. Um, and we swap all of our skills, and that, I think, is a really great one. Um, you know, one, there's more than enough business to go around, there's more than enough money to go around, but it's so great when, even when you're, it is great when your competitors become your friends, when you share people, um, ideas, when you can't do a job, the number of times I've not been able to do a job, passed it on to someone, and that lovely favour has returned itself, it's incredible. Um, and I know a lot of people that say, oh, that person really keeps their contacts close to them. Or, and I, I just don't get it. I do get it, but I don't <laughs> get it. Um, and I think that that's really helped me get further than I think I would have been had it been me just by myself. So I really recommend finding those lovely people that bring out the best in you, that you can also have a sort of um, a little cry with or a sort of um, commiserate when things don't go well. They get it. Um, another thing is, uh, lots of people... I've been asked before... I don't know why this comes up as a question in a lot of interviews. Do you think it's more... Do you think it's more important to be respected or to be liked? Have you ever come across that in magazines and things? 
And I find it quite a strange one because I'd like both, if that's okay. Um, I, I did one talk. Um, it was for, what was it for? It was a financial talk, not as scary as this because there were three, three of us on a panel and we were sitting down. See how I'm like just bouncing from that? I need to stop bouncing. Um, they said, do you think it's more respect, important to be respected or liked? And I said, I think it's incredibly important, going back to this, to like the people you work with. You know when you have to call someone on a Saturday and it's maybe not the work day, you want to know that that person kind of doesn't mind because they know that you're doing it for a reason and vice versa. When you have to get up and go on a flight at five in the morning, if you like that person, how much better is everything? When things are going wrong, how much better is everything? And I said, I, I think it's hugely important to work with people you like. Four minutes, oh my gosh, four minutes. Okay, very quickly. Um, then Alan Sugar, <clears throat> went on stage next and they asked him the same question and he went, nah, it is, I, I work with loads of people that I don't like <laughs> um, and it doesn't matter to me, they just got to do the job, it doesn't matter and I just, you know, everyone looked at me and I was like, I don't care. Um, there's where me and Alan disagree um, and, you know, that's two scores of thoughts. I, obviously, they've got to be good at their job. Um, I hire people based on the joy they bring me, basically, and, and obviously, they have to be good at their job. But a lot of the time you can teach the job and you can't teach the positive attitude. So I think that's super important. Right, wow. I'm going to be really quick now because I've got four minutes left. <laughs> uh, my next one was food, eat happy. I've sort of touched on this. Um, we know about good food. We know about it fueling us, energy, concentration, less stress, more pleasure, moodiness. I think this is a really big one. I think there's going to be a lot of conversations about mood, hormones, all of these good things. Have you ever at lunchtime, or no, afternoon, written a terrible, shitty email and regretted it because you didn't eat your lunch in time and your blood sugar, le sugar levels were crashing, everyone's laughing? Just eat your lunch before you have to write something angry, okay? Um, what else? I think I've sort of said it about, about the food. Oh, really, really important to chew. So all the, <laughs> all the kale smoothies in the world are not gonna help you if you don't chew your food. And on that note, smoothies, I'm not joking, you need to chew your smoothies. You need to sort of, like, wrap, this sounds so weird, wrap your saliva around each mouthful of smoothie. You're nodding, right? you know this. Just because it's blended is not an excuse to inhale it. That's why I was saying about the soup, sip the soup. Um, so, and on to soup, <laughs> sorry, soup again. If you can do one thing this weekend, it will take you half an hour, make some soup, make a massive batch of soup, stick it in your freezer in portions, then I want you to tweet me every time you defrost a portion and tell me how much better your life is. Okay, sleep, this is such an important one. I think sleeping is more important than working. So, um, you know, uh, make soup and go to bed. Um, my, mom, <laughs> my mom used to call bedtime beauty sleep and brain sleep. Ariana Huffington, who's the best person I've ever seen give a talk. Has anyone seen her talk? You need to get her here. Isn't she incredible? I think she would come. She would definitely want to come here. She wrote a book called Thrive, um, which was about when she was smashing it up at all ends and basically having a breakdown. She has that famous story about not, um, passing out through fatigue, knocking her head and being out of work for months. She wrote a book called Thrive and she talked tons about sleep. She then has written a book called The Sleep Revolution and now given up Huffington Post and now she's working on, uh, her new business is called Thrive and it's all about helping us do what we want to do, achieve our goals, but looking after ourselves at the same time. Her big thing is sleep. She says, and I do it, take, stop using your phone as an alarm clock. Don't have your phone in your bedroom. Buy an alarm clock, like the olden days, and use that instead, and then you're not tempted to look at it. Um, and yeah, just try and sleep more, even if it's that half an hour. And also, you know what's really important? I don't have time to go into it now, but your, the patterns of sleep, it's much more, it's better to sleep before 12. So don't go to bed at so 12 and then work, uh, and then, sorry, go to bed at 12 and then wake up at 8 and think I've got my 8 hours. If you can, do the 10 till 6. That's even better. We'll have to talk about that another time if you'll have me back. <laughs> right, really quickly now, self-love and pep talking. Um, I pep, oh, there it was, sleep, make bedtime sacred. Self-love and pep talks. I pep talked myself so hard on the way on the tube today. Um, one of my favourite ones is, I am enough. <laughs> 
Uh, it's a little card. My friend, she must come and give a talk. Her name is Holly DeCruz. She's got a company called The Yes Mum, and she's a holistic birthing expert. And she started creating these cards, basically a little bit like this, but really colourful, gorgeous cards. And she would give quotes. And the number of people that now carry them around, have them where they brush their teeth, put them on the fridge, all sorts of amazing things to say. I think it's hugely important to give yourself affirmations, to chat to yourself. Um, and if you're having a good day, chat to someone else. Pep talk someone else. Um, that comes back to the tribes as well. It, it is not cocky, it is not arrogant, and it is not cheesy. It is quite cheesy to talk to yourself and pep talk, but it, if we can't believe in ourselves, we've got to be our own best cheerleaders. Um, and again, that comes back to it's not perfect, but it's good. So that's another one that I say to myself. I'm, not, I'm enough. I'm enough. Right, balance and me time. Remember to have fun. Um, I feel that I've lost but got them back. A few friends along the years from being boring, from not turning up and showing up to the important things. Everybody's busy. Everybody's got an important job. I really regret missing important things because I said I'm really, really busy. So I think if you think that could be you, try and reframe your life because, you know, God, I'm getting emotional. Um, I'm 32 now, um, which is so young, but I look back and I really miss out on a lot of things. When my sister, well, when our dad was dying, actually, that is when it really kicked in for me. That was about two and a half years ago. He, he was having a long, long illness and then he died, but that was the most important thing for me is that I just went everything, like forget everything. I went and sat by his bedside and we massively reconnected as we hadn't for a long time because I'd been too wrapped up, he'd been too wrapped up. So this is a really important one for me. Um, and I'll quickly say now, because I know we've got to finish, I've got loads to say about balance and me time, but meditation, is anyone meditating yet? Oh, interesting, so about half of you. Is anyone interested but just thinks it's not for them? Yeah, a couple of you. I'd give it a go. And a bit like yoga and a bit like, you know, a good coffee, you know? There's bad meditation techniques. There's bad teachers, right? There's bad coffee. You need to just find the one that you vibe with. There's so many now. We're really lucky, especially here. They do meditation here. So they do yoga here. If you can, maybe I'll, I'll send, put up a couple of, you do? Oh, amazing. They, ah, oh, let's stay for lunch and meditate together. <laughs> Um, meditation can be whatever you want. It can be like we just did the breathing before we started. It can be short and sweet. They say, you know, 20 minutes is good. Sometimes I don't do it. Sometimes I don't do it for a week, but I don't beat myself up. Um, just find the person that works for you. There's a million different techniques. And the most important thing is it, fi it makes you feel good and works. Um, have I got time for one more slide? Yes, babe. Okay. This one. Is that the one? Yes, please. Okay. So, I can't go into these details. I'm going to send you all an email and tell you about a couple of things. I, if you want to give up a day or half a day and do some fun stuff with me, do something for someone else. So this puts things into perspective, especially if you're someone that suffers from low self-esteem, gets quite despondent about something else. I would say when you think you want a duvet day and you want to hide from the world, I totally get you. I have those days. I make myself go and do something for someone else. So I have three ideas of things that you could do. I'll quickly run through them. I do them all. I'd love help. Um, one of them is um, the Prince's Trust. There's an amazing new mentoring scheme, which is a bit more longer term, but won't take too much of your time. And you get a lovely young person to work with. And you can just keep it really simple, send them encouraging emails, help them with their CV, that sort of thing. That would be amazing. There is also a company called Mazzy Mass, which is a social enterprise for refugee women. And if you love food, you'll love hanging out with them. They cook, they basically cook the food from their homeland. There's a South Sudanese woman, an Ethiopian, there's three Iranian women, and you get to basically hang out with them. The point of that enterprise is they do catering. So if you ever need catering for an event, look them up, Mazzy Mass. They earn, they, the point is to then earn enough money that they can bring out their own products. So I know tons of you are graphic designers. They really need some branding help. So that would be great. That would maybe be half a day or a day. And then feedback. I hosted an event for feedback. It's a food waste charity. They always just need a little couple of hours. If anyone can drive a van to go and collect the shocking amount of vegetables that get thrown away um, from supermarkets, or even farmers who don't have enough people Farmers maybe an hour out of London who don't have enough people to pick up 
the pairs. They've got too many pairs, so they're just going to leave them there because they physically cannot pick them all up. You could help collect those pairs, sort them, and give them to a, a charity shelter. So it gets you away from your business doing this, it gives you back to the world, and it makes you feel good. I definitely don't have time for the last one, which is be kind to you, but I guess we've covered most of it. I think that's my number one tip that I found about wanting to make a difference in the world is if you cannot look after yourself, you know, don't, just start with yourself. If you really want to put amazing things in, whether it's for somebody else or it's a product you've got, look after yourself, keep your energy intact, rest when you need to so that you can go on and do these things and, you know, smash, smash them up. So that's kind of it, really. Um, can we give a huge round of applause for this? Thank you so much. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.